I'm Dr. Dillard. Follow me on my journey of on becoming a slave master. On this journey, I will be tracing my family's roots back to the slave plantation where they worked as slaves. I will use my family and their slave master's family to contrast why we have a rich and prosperous white America and a poor black America. Once I trace my roots back to the slave plantation, I will trace the owner or the slave master of the plantation. I will trace the slave master's roots and in doing so, we will see how and when he came to America. We will see if he had money and wealth when he arrived to the new world. We will follow him to see just how he became involved in the slave trade. We'll see how he obtained land to start a slave plantation. We shall see how he used his slaves to make money. We will look at how he used slavery and the profits he made from it to create a better life for himself and his descendants. We will look at his descendants and their prosperity. In 1793, the Virginia State General Assembly authorized construction of a tobacco warehouse at Wands Fall. This marked the start of the town as the world's best tobacco market. The village was renamed Danville by an act of the Virginia legislature on November 23, 1793. The downtown district hosts many tobacco warehouses these warehouses held tobacco from the surrounding slave plantations, like the Swanson Plantation in Swansonville, located just 10 miles northeast of Danville. Tobacco auctions was held in the warehouses. During the Civil War, they were used as prisons to hold captured Union soldiers. These are my relatives, descendants of slaves who worked on the Swanson Plantation. Like most African-American descendants of slaves, they have struggled to manage to eke out a meager living while all the time having to endure poverty, oppression, discrimination, and not allowed to fully participate in America's prosperity. Although later we shall see how they created it. This is the grave site of my grandfather, John Albert Swanson. Like most slave descendants, he held a name similar to the slave master's offspring, whose name was John Mew Swanson. This is Claude Swanson, his father, and my great grandfather. He was born a slave, and that's why we have no photos of him. He took the name of his slave master's son whose name was also Clyde. Both of their African heritage, as well as mine, completely erased. This is the substandard housing they lived in as they slaved away, creating a prosperous life for white people to enjoy. The slave descendants were relegated in an area in Danville called Almagro. As kids, we often referred to it as meaning all Negro. It was a very hilly land and very hard to grow crops for food because when we planted seed, it was washed away during heavy rains. But then we were black and placed on the dismal margins of society to stay out of sight of the manicured white community. I'm driving to Swansonville, named for the Swanson slave master, 
it is the site of the Swanson Plantation. It's the site that for centuries my ancestors worked for free, creating a very prosperous life for the slave masters. You have to wonder what kind of people who would not share with their slaves who created prosperity for them, some type of generosity. The Swansonville Methodist Church sit in the center of what used to be the plantation. Behind the church is the cemetery of the Swanson ancestors, all slave masters who ran the plantation over a couple of centuries. The obelisk gravestone tell us they were Freemasons, like George Washington and other signers of the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. They were large landowners who used slaves to create their wealth. The Swanson Plantation stretched as far as the eye could see. Plus the Swansons owned plantations in Northern Virginia, Central Virginia, Southern Virginia, and in three counties in Georgia. Their crop was mostly tobacco on the Virginia plantation with some corn and in Georgia they grew cotton. Let's go find out just who are the Swanson Slave Masters. I'm here at the Atlanta airport on my way to Stockholm, Sweden. Stockholm is the birthplace of the slave master Swanson. I'm going to Stockholm because I want to be able to trace his roots and how he got started, what ship he came to America on, the year he came to America, just actually how he came to America and became a slave master, enslaving human beings, which were my descendants, my family. I've already introduced you to my family, and I've introduced you to the plantation in Swansonville where my family worked on. So follow with me to Sweden, and let's find out just who the slave master was. Stockholm at the airport, and I'm going over to uh, to check into my hotel, and then I'm going to go to the historical museum to look up information on the Swansons. Stockholm is the capital of Sweden. It encompasses 14 islands and more than 50 bridges on an extensive Baltic Sea archipelago. The 
the cobblestone streets and colored buildings of the old town are home to the 13th century royal palace and the Nobel Museum, which focuses on the Nobel Prize. Ferries and sightseeing boats show passengers between the islands. I'm in Stockholm at the Swedish Historical Society and in this building is the genealogy of the Swansons. I'm at the Nordic Museum here in Stockholm. In this museum, they're supposed to have records of the Carmel Nickel. The Carmel Nickel was the ship that Swin Garnison and his family sailed to America on in 1638. According to the Nordic Museum's records, Swin Garnison was the patriarch to the Swanson. He had immigrated to Sweden from Finland where he was convicted and sentenced to six years indentureship in America for desertion of the Swedish army while Sweden was at war with Denmark. He and his family was put on board the Kalmau Nickel, a sailing ship, and sent to America in 1640 to work in the Swedish colony in Delaware. His descendants anglicized Garnison to Swanson after a few years living in America. I visited the Swedish Naval Museum to see a replica of the ship, the Kalmau Nickel. I also learned at the Nordic Museum that Gustavus Adolphus II, King of Sweden, from 1611 until 1632. Under his rule, Sweden became a superpower and the third largest nation in Europe after Russia and Spain. He died while leading a charge at the Battle of Lutzen. Christina, his underage daughter, inherited the crown. Her regency, those charged with her care desired to establish a colony in America. After conquering Finland, many Finns immigrated into Sweden because Finland was heavily forested and they lived in the forest they were called forest Finns. They used slash and burn agriculture and was burning down the forest in northern Sweden. They were also agitators of the Swedish government 
and many deserted from the Swedish army. Because they posed so many problems to the government, the Swedish crown rounded up the deserters to send to work as indentures in the new colony to be in America. Peter Minuit, who purchased Manhattan Island for $24 from the Indians for the Dutch, partnered with the Swedish government to create their first colony in the New World. Swen Gonnison was one of the deserters that was captured. He and his pregnant wife and two young children were put on board the Kalmau Nickel, a sailing ship, and sent to America in 1640. Peter Minuit and the Swedish government formed the New Sweden Company. Its charter included Swedish, Dutch, and German stockholders. And by directors of the New Sweden Company, Minuit would be the governor of the new colony. Minuit had the men perform small repairs and stop the Kalmau Nickel for the voyage to America. On a sunny morning in 1640, he ordered the men to lower the sails, man the guns, they fired cannon shots as they set the sails for the voyage to America. After a couple of days of sailing, a violent storm nearly destroyed the ship. The Kalmau Nickel found shelter in the harbor of Texel, a port city in Holland. Once the repairs were completed, the ship continued on its voyage to the New World. Along the way, Swen Garnison's wife, Gertrude, delivered their third child, whom they named Olive. They called him Olive for short. Within a couple of months, they sailed into the Delaware Bay, passing Cape May and Cape Henlopen. and anchored at Memphis Kill, known today as Swedes Landing, at Fort Christina, named for Queen Christina. Minuet met with the Delaware and the Susquehannock chiefs and persuaded them to sign deeds for land in West Philadelphia, southeastern Pennsylvania, Delaware, and coastal Maryland. Later, Chief Matterhorn of the Delawares 
claimed the land purchased was within an area marked by only six trees. The rest of the land occupied by the Swedes was stolen. Swim Gonnison worked on the Fort Christina tobacco plantation until 1645. In October 1645, he was granted his freedom and became Swin the Miller because he operated the first grist mill built in New Sweden. In 1664, he moved his family to Wakako to a, an 1125-acre plantation he had paid the Indians a teapot and some trinkets for. Later, the chief said he was only allowed land he could walk from sun up to sundown. Maybe he ran 1125 acres in a day. Swin built the Glory Day Church on the land in 1677. He died about 1678 and one of the first to be buried at the Wakako Church. After the death of Swin, his three sons, Swin, Olive, and Anders, inherited the 1125 acres he had bought from the Indians for a teapot and a few trinkets. In 1655, New Sweden, the Swedish colony, was captured by the Dutch. Swin's three boys, Swin, Olive, and Anders, ceded all but 690 acres to William Penn in 1682 for his charter to develop what is now Philadelphia. Each of his sons kept 230 acres. They anglicized their last name to Swanson and assimilated into the current English culture. Swin and Olive became members of the Upland Court, allowed by the English to have jurisdiction over the former Swedish colonies. Andrew's son, Anders, went on to become the progenitor of the DuPonts of Delaware. Andrew's son, William, migrated to Goochland County, Virginia, where he prospected in lands and created slave plantation. In December, 1750, he bought a 200 acre plantation. In June, 1752, he sold a 200 acre plantation and bought an 800 acre plantation in December 1752. In December 1757, he sold 300 acres of the 800 acre plantation. In December 1761, he sold off another 100 acres of the plantation. In October 1762, he sold the remaining 400 acres. Within a month, he bought 282-acre plantation in Bedford County in November 1762. 
he bought another 325 acres in that same month in Bedford County. He received a land grant from the Virginia Company who dismissed the rights of the Native Americans claiming right of discovery. They granted him 320 acres to develop into another plantation in August of 1763. In June 1769, he sold 125 acres. In July 1769, he sold a 325 acre plantation. In September 1772, he sold 282 acres. And in February 1773, he sold 320 acres. We moved into Pennsylvania County, and in November 1768, he bought 400 acres. December of the same year, he bought 100 acres. 242 acres was transferred to William on May 1786. The tide table shows some of his slaves, Rogers, Daniel, Venus, and Sarah. In August 1779, he started buying plantation land in Henry County, where he bought 162 acres. In October of that same year, he sold 150 acres he held in Pennsylvania County. Finally, he started plantations in Franklin County, Virginia. In January 1787, he bought 200 acre plantation. In February 1787, he sold 175 acres of his Pennsylvania County plantation. On March 1787, he sold 175 acres on both sides of Bull Run River, his Pennsylvania County Plantation. The soil in Virginia exhausted key nutrients, in particularly nitrogen, so most plantations were only good for growing tobacco for just two to three years. Then slave masters moved to new land to make into plantations. 
we have seen to have mastered that process concerning his buying and selling of plantations in five counties in Virginia. From 1735 to 1750, the state of Georgia prohibited African slavery. After South Carolina plantation owners began gaining wealth from slavery, Georgia overturned their ban and decided to use slaves to grow rice and cotton. Georgia plantation owners requested Africans from the great city of Benin region of Africa, which is present-day Sierra Leone, Gambia, and Angolia, for their knowledge of building earthworks, and dams, and banks, and irrigation systems to support rice and cotton crops. To foster growth, in 1780, Georgia began offering land if people moved to the state. The land economy was developed when the, the European country established the colony. So it wasn't until the, like, the uh, Revolutionary War when it actually created that what they call was land bounty where if you were a soldier in the army or an officer, you were awarded a certain amount of land. Like some generals got 25,000 acres of land, like Robert E. Lee, uh, Washington, uh, Paul Revere, uh, Jefferson, all those guys. They were, the government gave them land with those large lands they had and they could grow uh, products and they could ship them and make money. So now they got the land, but blacks and the slaves were never allowed to participate in the land bound. The slaves never had an opportunity to acquire land or acquire wealth and they could only just work on those plantations that were owned by uh, the whites. And that's what really started America because without owning something, you had no wealth. But because the whites could participate in the land bounty, they had immense opportunity. Years before blacks were able to own land. In early 1787, William Swanson, having sold some of his plantations in Virginia, moved to Greene County, Georgia, and started buying plantations. He bought a 575-acre plantation on the Oconee River in Greene County, Georgia, in January 5, 1787. Of course, they wouldn't let me do any filming inside the courthouse at the land and deed office, but they did let me do some photocopies of some of the deeds. After selling his land and slaves in Virginia, he bought the land bought more slaves, and helped to develop out the state of Georgia. Using his land and his slaves, that development of Georgia exists right today. So his descendants and a lot of other slave owners' descendants in the state of Georgia, by utilizing their slaves, helped to develop the state, and they enjoyed that environment, but the slaves was relegated to substandard living and substandard means. On August 2nd, 1787, he bought 300 plus acre plantation 
on the North Fork of Little River in Wilkes County, Georgia. So that's the Wilkes County Courthouse and again they wouldn't let me take any film in there but I was able to look through the land and the deed records and William Swanson purchased land in this county after uh, purchasing acreage in Greens County. He moved here, he purchased a bunch of land here, had a bunch of slaves and he uh, did farming, probably growing tobacco. And um, of course with the slaves, they developed out this area. And uh, so of course the slaves wasn't allowed to participate and enjoy and in the infrastructure and the environments that they built for the slave owners and other whites in the area. And even up until this day, it's the same. Uh, descendants of slaves Black African Americans are not allowed to participate in uh, American society. The majority of blacks are still on the margins of society and where they remain on those margins. I'm on my way to a town called Lexington, Georgia. It's in Ogathorpe County. I'm going to Lexington because in Lexington is the county courthouse and it's gonna have all the birth records and all the property deeds that Slave Master Swanson owned. I'll be able to find out what he did with the property, who he gave the property to, and how much property it was, and the people that he um, bequeathed the property to when he passed away. I'll be able to find out exactly who they were and where their family background goes. Like if they married, like if a Swanson married a Coleman, then I gotta trace that Coleman line to find out what they did with the property. So when we get to uh, Lexington, to the courthouse, then uh, I'll go inside and I'll look at the records. William Sr. died around November 7, 1808, in Oglethorpe County, Georgia. This is his last will and testament. The will states, I give and recommend my soul to Almighty God to be buried in a Christian manner, hoping at the resurrection I shall receive the same again and family slaves wealth by the mighty power of God and touching such worldly estate which it has pleased God to bless me with in this life. I require that the names of my slaves 
to be set on a piece of paper, put into a box, and be drawn and divided to my children in apes. In the will, William gives to Nathan $850, a slave wench named Sylvia, and a Negro boy named Adam that he had rented out to him, one-eighth of all of his other slaves, and one-eighth of all of his money that was left. To Sarah Ryan, he gave one-eighth of his slaves and one-eighth of his money. To Mary Wilson, he gave $350, a slave wench named Nanny, plus one-eighth of his slaves and one-eighth of his money. To William, Jr., he gave $321, one-eighth of his slaves and one-eighth of his money. And Swanson, he gave $275, a slave boy, one-eighth his slaves, one-eighth his money. And Fanny, he gives $235, slave wench named Nancy, one-eighth of his slaves, and one-eighth of his money. His grandsons, James and John, heirs of his uh, son, John Swanson, he gave one-eighth slaves and one-eighth his money. To his granddaughters, Anne, Betsy, Sally, and Polly, $350 each, one-eighth slaves, one-eighth money, and a slave wench named Rachel. After the death of William, he was taken back to Swansonville, Virginia, and buried in a cemetery in the rear of the Swansonville Methodist Church. William Jr. had remained at the plantation in Swansonville, Virginia, when his father William had moved to Georgia. He continued to run a tobacco plantation with his son, William Graves Swanson. The two went on and created the Swansonville Supply Company, the Swanson Brothers Company, the Park Place Mercantile Company, and became part owners in the Turner Brothers Tobacco Company and Manufacturing, and the Dudley and Clement Lumber Company, located in Greensboro, North Carolina. From the plantations his father ran in Georgia, during off season when not harvesting cotton, William Jr. sent his slaves to the recent discovered gold mine to mine gold for him. In 1828, a slave owned by a man named Logan found gold on a branch in the Nakuchi River. The slaves knew how to find gold as their technique had been passed down to them for centuries. White independent miners hated the slave miners because they were best at finding gold and often referred to them as proverbially lucky. Slave owners rushed to the region and sent their slaves to mine for gold. Some slaves were promised freedom if they found enough gold, but they were never freed no matter the amount they found. Slave owners became wealthy from the gold fields, and the slaves were not permitted to stake claims in the gold fields. The gold fields was in the Cherokee Nation, but when Logan's slave discovered the gold, the U.S. government rounded up the Indians and put them on the Trail of Tears march to Oklahoma and took over their lands. From 1808 to 1914, John Swanson and John Mew Swanson 
son and grandson of William Graves Swanson increased the family's business holdings as they invested their profits from enslaving human beings. The family's business portfolio went from a meager ice company to a commercial bank. The list of family-owned businesses now included Turner Brothers Tobacco Company, Swanson Bill Supply Company, Swanson Brothers Company, Park Place Mercantile Company, Dudley and Clement Lumber Company, Ogilvy and Swanson Brothers, South Atlantic Lumber Company, the Arctic Ice Company, the Commercial Bank of Danville. These are the legends of the Swanson Brothers businesses found at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. We became a legislator in the Virginia State Legislature and began to push for a railroad line to connect Danville to Richmond as a fast way to move tobacco and lumber throughout the region. With his allies, the state of Virginia granted him a charter to build a railroad line. William and his allies used their slaves and built 140 miles of railroad track to connect Danville to Richmond by rail. Up until the Civil War, around 1850, all the railroads in the United States were being built by African-American slaves. Over 15,000 slaves built over 8,700 miles of railroad track. If we laid this railroad track out in a straight line, it would cross the United States three times. Investors spent over $370 million by 1850 invested in the railroads. Ten years later, by 1860, they had invested over $1 billion. None of this was shared with the slaves, and none of it has been shared with the descendants of the slaves, even though the ancestors of the slaves built these railroads. Chartered on March 9, 1847, the railroad completed its 140-mile line between Richmond and Danville in 1856. During the American Civil War, the railroad was a vital link between Richmond, the Confederate capital, and the rest of the Confederacy. Many slaves died building the railroads as it was dangerous work and used men, women, and children. Slave owners insured them 
and was compensated for their deaths. Though the slaves built the railroads, they were not allowed to ride on the trains they were built for. Now we can add the Danville Richmond Railroad line to the list of businesses owned by the Swanson brothers. 73% of white people in America today believe the descendants of slaves, the majority of whom live in poverty, should not be compensated or reparated for their contributions in building the infrastructure of the American economic superpower. They normally respond with, I didn't own any slaves, or I'm not responsible for what my ancestors did. Claude Augustus Swanson was born March 31st, 1862, on the Swanson Plantation in Swansonville. He was the last Swanson slave master and was three years old when the Civil War ended, freeing the slaves. Though he was only three years old when the slaves were freed, let's see how he enjoyed and prospered like the 73% of white people today who say they didn't own any slaves from the infrastructure built by the slaves. At the end of the Civil War, the government paid $350 to each slave owner for each slave that they freed for reparations. In today's money, that's $8,000 per slave. Claude attended school at the Woodmill Farm Life School. It was a two-room schoolhouse built by slaves on the plantation. It was the first school in Pennsylvania County, Virginia, organized by the wealthy slave owners and taught by Celestial Parish, a Swansonville native. It eventually became the Whitmill School, named after the famed state legislator and remained on the state's historical society list. After completing the Whitmill Farm Life School, Claude attended the Randolph-Macon College. It was built by slaves in 1830 and was attended by males only. Currently, both men and women attend. The campus housed three buildings, Washington and Franklin Hall and the Methodist Church. Today, it boasts 116 acres and 60 major buildings. Claude graduated in June 1885, having majored in Latin, Germany, and chemistry, and decided to study law at the University at Charlottesville, Virginia. The story of the American college is largely the story of the rise of the slave economy, spoken by Craig Wilder, historian, MIT. Slaves built the University of Virginia starting in 1817 until 1865, the end of the Civil War. They were rented from local slave owners who was paid their wages. Once the university was built, the slaves worked maintaining classrooms, laboratories, the library, ringing the bell, and catering to the daily needs of students and faculty. The irony is, Ancestors of the slaves once taught white people in the universities of Africa. Now they were not even allowed to read and attending the universities they built was out of the question. After law school, he returned to Swansonville, practiced law, and engaged in regional politics. Claude became the 45th governor of Virginia in 1906. Slaves built the mansion in 1813. All the governors who spent a term in the mansion is remembered. Even the furniture is often recorded, but there's not a name or picture of a slave that built it or who served the governors and his family while living there. During his term, he defunded the few schools for blacks the state had and set up a eugenics program that would flourish. The Virginia New Program sought to protect the purity of the white race with forced sterilization of those deemed unworthy or unfit to procreate. Many African-American women were sterilized, 
unknowingly as they were told some other explanation for their operations. Clyde became the 45th Senator of Virginia from 1910 until 1933. He moved his home to Eldon, a plantation in Chatham, Virginia, where he lived when not in Washington, D.C. He supported child labor law and banking law reforms, reduced tariffs and federal funding of highway construction, but opposed women's suffrage. Claude became Secretary of the Navy in Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration from 1933 to his death in 1939. While Navy Secretary, he oversaw passage and implementation of the largest peacetime Navy appropriations up to that time. Upon his death, his funeral rites were held in the Senate chamber in Washington, D.C. He was buried in the Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia. Holding his final resting place with two U.S. presidents, James Madison and John Tyler, as well as Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, and 25 Confederate generals, including George Pickett and Jeb Stewart. For Claude's service to the nation and the Navy, the USS Swanson, a destroyer-class ship of the U.S. Navy, was named for him. After its launch, it began escort and convoy duties between New England Bermuda and Iceland. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, its convoy duties were extended to Scotland, Nova Scotia, and Greenland. The destroyer was decommissioned December 10, 1945, and scrapped in 1972. He died, leaving a last will and testament to his second wife, Luli Lyons, the sister of his first wife. Elizabeth Dean Lyons. Neither wife bore him a child. Claude's will to his wife included ownerships in Dan River Cotton Mills, South Atlantic Lumber Company, Dominion Securities Corporation, Intercontinental Development Company, Standard Brands, Espado Mines Company, Virginia and Mexico Mine and Smelter Incorporation, Washington Gold Mining Company, Riverside Land Company, Sullivan Group Mining Company, Wonderful Group Mining Company, Miller Creek Mining Company, Six Mile Canyon Mining Company, and Old Dominion Gold Mines Company. Total inheritance left to his wife was $181,170. And in today's dollars, it totaled $3,623,400. This did not include 
real estate he owned. Twin Gunnison had five children, 32 grandchildren, and 120 great-grandchildren. Among his many descendants today are all the members of the DuPont family of Delaware, who trace their lineage to Christopher Swanson, William's brother. 